Hi, I'm Rick Martinez, a food editor and recipe developer at Food Network. I have a passion for Mexican food and cuisine. I've traveled the country for the last 20 years, and one of my favorite stews in the whole country is pozole. It's rich, it's hearty, it's satisfying, and I'm making it for you today. So pozole is both the name of the stew, but it's also the name of the star ingredient. So this is pozole, or hominy, in its dried state. And this is what it looks like once it's cooked. It's a little more rustic, and it's supposed to look like it's exploding on the top. So think about it like popcorn, except you're boiling it. It just releases so much flavor. I think it has a much better texture than the stuff that you get in the can, which is what this is, and you can see it's much more uniform, it's much more, I mean, frankly, industrial because it exists in a can. But for this recipe, we're using the can because it's easier. So I'm gonna show you how I like to treat it to get rid of that tinny flavor. I have a bowl of pozole or hominy that is already rinsed and drained. And what I like to do is I like to toast it first. So you just wanna spread this out on a sheet tray. I'm lining it with foil because it's easier to clean up, frankly. It is gonna stick as it dries and cooks. I'm gonna throw this in a really hot oven, so 450 for about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm gonna toss it halfway through uh, cooking just to make sure that they're not sticking and to make sure that the, the pozole on the bottom are actually getting evenly toasted. For this version, I have some really, really beautiful chilies. So these chilies I actually brought back with me from Mexico. So they're super fresh, they're super fragrant. This is an ancho, and one of the reasons why I love this so much is because it actually has a lot of flavors of raisin and date and apricot. This is the guajillo, and this is much more like a paprika. Uh, think of it, uh, it has slightly more heat than the ancho. This is a pasilla. This is really earthy. It almost has kind of a, a, a vegetal or grassy kind of flavor. I really like this to kind of balance out the heat and the sweetness of the ancho and the guajillo. And then this is a chili morita. I love this chili a lot, but it is really spicy. So if you're gonna use it, you probably only need one or two to flavor an entire dish. So now that I've explained these, I am going to seed and stem them so we can toast them. I am going to use gloves for this. Some of these chilies are hotter than others, and really the, the main reason why I'm using gloves is because they will stain your hands, especially when you're using really nice, fresh, dried chilies. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just pull off the woody stem end of the ancho, and then a lot of the seeds will just fall out as you open it. But sometimes the seeds will stick. So just get in there and pull them out. If you can't get a couple of seeds, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. In Mexico, it's pretty common to toast the chilies and it does add a really nice nutty flavor. If you have older chilies and they're dry and brittle, toasting is a good way to coax out the flavor. Uh, when you're heating them up, not only does it caramelize the sugars, but you'll also reactivate all of the oils in the chili that provide the flavor. So you might not be able to smell it when it's in its untoasted form, but once you put it in the oven, they'll wake back up and you'll actually get the fragrance of the dried chilies. I've created a foolproof way of doing this. It's five minutes in a 350 degree oven. There's, unless your oven is really messed up, you're not gonna burn them at all. It's really simple, it's really easy. A lot of recipes in the US call for toasting these on a skillet or a griddle which again, I just find it's really hard to, to control the heat. So toasting in the oven is just a much easier foolproof method. All right, the only one that I'm not gonna seed, but I will stem, is the morita. Because it's a jalapeno, the, uh, the seeds are a lot smaller and they'll break down in the blender. Also, I wanna keep the heat in there because I really like the heat in this dish. All right, these are ready to be toasted. Now that these are all ready to go into the oven, I'm gonna pull my hominy out, which is smelling really fragrant and toasty. It almost has like a caramel corn flavor. Oh, it looks great. I'm gonna reduce the oven down to 350 and then I'll put the peppers in. You really don't wanna walk away from your oven at this point. 
These chilies will go from really toasty and fragrant to burnt and bitter really quickly. So you'll notice, like, so it's five minutes in the oven, but each minute will change. You'll start to smell the differences. So they're gonna get really fragrant. They'll start to smell like chilies again. And then you'll, they'll start to get a little bit nutty, a little bit caramelly. And then all of a sudden after minute six, they're burnt. It's better to actually err on the side of undercooking them than overcooking them. Because like I said, once they've gone to bitter and burnt, there's no going back. It's been five minutes. They're smelling really good and toasty. I'm gonna pull these out. All right. All right, so now that the pozole is toasted and the chilies are toasted, I'm gonna brown the meat. I'm using pork. This is boneless pork shoulder and I'm gonna leave it whole. The reason why I'm doing that is because it's easier to brown when it's whole. So I've got my pan preheated. I'm gonna put in two tablespoons of veg oil. You want this to be really hot. You don't wanna put your meat into a cold pan and you'll know if it's ready when you see little wisps of smoke. And you'll also notice I'm not gonna season this right now because I don't want to pull any of the, uh, the juices out of the meat as it browns. And that is exactly the sound that you want to hear. That means we're searing the outside of the meat, we're not steaming it. While that's browning, I'm going to prep the rest of the vegetables. So I have garlic. I want 16 cloves of garlic for this dish, which may seem like a lot, but they're gonna cook down. It's a, it's a long, slow braise. It's gonna cook for about two hours, so they're gonna get really mild in flavor. And with these garlic, it doesn't matter if you're crushing them slightly. If you keep them whole, it's fine. In the end, it'll all be blended in the sauce. I prefer using my hand, but if you don't wanna use your hand, you can also give it a crush like that. I think this is probably done. Yeah. And this is what you're looking for, this beautiful, deep, golden brown color. Ah, oh, so nice. And I really feel like it would be very difficult to achieve that level of browning if you had cubed this piece of meat, because with more surface area, you're gonna pull out a lot more of the, the liquid. And especially if you had salted this, you're just gonna end up pulling out a lot of the liquid and your finished stew is actually gonna be really dry as a result. All right. So next we're gonna do the onion. So I'm gonna go ahead and just chop it. I like to have it and then peel the skin off. I just find that it's easier that way. Okay. The way that I like to cut an onion, and for this I don't really need a fine dice, but you always wanna start at the stem end. Put your hand down and then with a really sharp knife, just give it a nice even cut towards the root end. You don't have to go all the way back. You want it to hold its shape a little bit. Keep your palm down. Then come back, turn it, and just go through making cuts across the center. Come back. Nice dice. And then for the root end, you can just give it a little chop like that. We're not going necessarily for pre precision. It'll get blended in the end, but I do want to get that caramelization. Stem end, going to the root, palm down, make the cross cuts. And that's done. All right. Yep. All right, I think my meat is done. I'm gonna grab this sheet tray. I'm gonna turn the, the heat down because it is pretty hot in there. I'm only browning two sides. You could brown the other two if you wanted, but I don't think it's really necessary. I'm gonna get a lot of that nice caramelization from what I've done on the two sides. Just put this back here. Now I'm going to brown my veg.
you want to turn your heat down. We don't want to burn the, the onions, and they're going to caramelize at a much lower temp than that big piece of meat. That was a lot of garlic, but the flavors are going to meld, and pork and garlic go really, really well together, and particularly in this dish. All right, this is looking really good. You want to stir it occasionally and just pick up a lot of the brown bits from the pork. That's a lot of flavor. I'm gonna go ahead and add the salt at this point. What this is gonna do is it's going to draw out some of the moisture, which in the pork I didn't want to happen because I didn't want the pork to dry out. For the vegetables, I do wanna pull out the moisture because what that's gonna do is it's, it's gonna coax out the flavor, but also the sugars in the vegetables. So that's gonna add another layer of caramelization, another layer of flavor. It's gonna sweeten both the onions and the garlic. It's gonna take away their sort of bitter, harsh edge. I think this is looking really good. I'm gonna go through again just to make sure I'm getting all the nice brown bits up. That's really, really good flavor. You don't wanna lose that in the pan. This looks really good. Now I'm gonna add the chilies. And you don't have to crush them up, just drop them in. And now the spices. I'm using a few peppercorns. I'm using Mexican oregano, of course. Uh, if you don't have it, you can definitely use just regular Italian oregano. I'm using one clove. Cloves are really pungent, and I just want you know a little bit of a back note of that warming spice. And now I'm going to add 10 cups of water. If you have a fresh stock, uh, like a fresh chicken stock, you could definitely use that. But because this is a long, slow braise, you're gonna pull out so much flavor, I feel like water's perfectly fine. I've cranked the heat to high just to get this to boil. As soon as it boils, I'll drop the, uh, the pork in and then we'll add the fresh herbs. We've come up to a boil, now I'm gonna grab the pork. And we'll just nestle this right in there. And it's totally fine if it just sits on top of those chilies. And then you just wanna tuck your herbs in on the side. Drop your bay leaf in. You just want them to, to sit on top because we're gonna fish them out once this is cooked. I'm gonna cover this, reduce it to low and let it just cook for two, two and a half hours, and then I'm gonna come back and pull the pork out and start shredding. It's been just a little bit over two hours. The kitchen smells amazing. I can't wait to see what this looks like. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, it looks so good. Hmm. And I'm just gonna test the pork to make sure that it's done. I'm pretty certain it is, but yeah, look at that. It just like barely touching it and it just wants to fall apart. That's exactly what you want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this off. So my herb shifted a little bit while it was cooking and that's totally fine. I'm gonna try and fish out as much as I can now and then I'll just pull the rest. The stems are pretty tender and especially now that they've been cooking for so long. I'll try and find the bay leaves as I go along. All right. So I'm going to carefully pull out this pork. If it's really, really tender, you may want to get a spoon or a spat to help you out, but you can just see, look how beautiful that is, wow. It just wants to fall apart. Okay, I'm gonna not play with it and just let it hang out there and cool off before I start shredding it. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to blend the sauce. So I've got my blender. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pull a lot of these chilies into the blender it's gonna be a lot easier than just trying to pour the liquid with all the chilies in there. Okay. Now, you can use a ladle, you can use a coffee cup. I've got a measuring cup here. I feel like this is the most efficient way to do this. I'm gonna transfer this juice over. All right, you don't wanna fill this too much. The only thing that I really wanna do is make sure that the chilies are nicely blended. 
It's very hot liquid, and so just in case, I'm gonna put this on low just to start. And then just gradually increase until the sauce is smooth. Unlike salsas or enchilada sauce, it's okay if this goes really high, because we're gonna cook it again, so if I do incorporate air into this sauce, the bubbles will release by the time we actually go to serve. What's important is that you completely pulverize the chilies. You don't want any bits of, of chili left in there. And so you can see it looks pretty smooth. I don't see any large pieces of chili. So I feel like that is good. So I'm gonna pour this into a measuring cup. If you don't have a measuring cup this large, you can totally use a bowl. Look how smooth that is. Oh, looks so good. Mm. All right. So now we're gonna blend the rest of the juice. All right, this looks good. But you can see, it just has a really nice richness. It would be the equivalent of, you know, a thin creamed soup. And also, you know, if you have really good chilies, you know, why not, why not add them to the dish so you can actually taste them? I wanna bring this up to a boil, and I'm gonna add the hominy. So the hominy, which is toasted and pretty dry, is going to basically soften up and rehydrate in the sauce. I really like this step because the flavors are gonna meld and they're gonna trade places. You're gonna get some of the chili broth into the pozole and then the pozole is gonna release some of its corn flavor into the soup. If you just put the hominy straight from the can into this dish, A, you wouldn't need to cook it for that long because it's already pretty hydrated, but I just feel like you're gonna get that can flavor uh, throughout the, uh, the dish. So. I highly recommend that extra step of toasting your hominy. So this is going to simmer over medium heat for about 20 minutes. And while that's cooking, I'm going to shred the pork. So now I'm gonna shred. As you saw, it's like, it's, oh, look at that, it's just falling apart. You don't need to go crazy. I mean, it's a soup, so you want, you know, decent bite-sized pieces, but you don't want anything really, really huge. You want it to fit on a spoon, but you want this consistency. This is an untrimmed uh, pork shoulder, so if the, the fat is gonna bother you, then you can definitely remove it. To me, it's really nice to have a little piece of fat attached to your meat. It's added flavor. It also breaks up the texture. I think we are ready to go back in. It's been about 20 minutes that the pozole has been cooking. I've got it, um, I reduced it down to low because it was simmering nicely. It's gonna depend on what size burner you have. It's so beautiful, but you can see the hominy is actually plumped up from how it was when it went in. I'm gonna give it a little taste, make sure we're good on seasoning. Oh, so good, oh my God. Uh, I'm gonna give it a little bit more salt because we're now gonna add three pounds of pork shoulder that has been unseasoned. So we wanna make sure that we can taste the pork. All right, now I'm going to add this all in. Just carefully add it in because this will stain your clothes and it's also super hot. So don't just like dump it in, it will splash out at you. And the pork is actually still a little bit warm. All we're doing at this point is heating through. The pozole is nice and tender. You don't wanna overcook the pork. The pork will actually dry out if you tried to simmer it for a long time. That rich red color. So this is exactly what pozole rojo should look like. And it's a stew, so you know it's not, it's not really that soupy. This is the consistency I like. It should be really, really hearty. Think of a, a really nice winter or fall stew. Oh, it's so beautiful. So as soon as this comes up to a simmer, it's done. While that is heating up, I am going to go grab all my toppings. All right, finally, I get to try this thing. Got my ladle. I'm going to build my bowl. Oh, look at that. 
so good. Mm. Now, uh, like I'm, I'm feel like a kid in the candy store. I don't know what to do first. Definitely need onion. Put in some avocado for a little color. A couple of radishes. Do a little bit of queso fresco. Do a little bit of cabbage, not too much. A few of these guys. I love the crunch of the fried tortilla strips. Also, it just pulls out more of that corn flavor. A little bit of crushed oregano. And a squeeze of lime. This looks so good. Finally, I'm gonna eat this. All right. Mmm, it's so flavorful. The lime just really cuts through the richness of the broth. The other great thing about toasting the hominy is they actually have a really nice texture. Out of the can, they can be really kind of soft and squishy and they have a little bit of bite to them now. They're almost al dente. Oh. And the great thing about putting all these toppings in is that every bite's a little bit different. Mmm, this is one of my absolute favorite dishes and Whenever I go to Mexico City, I hit the pozolerias, I invite friends to come and meet me. We have a really great, amazing time, and it's really all centered around this dish. It's so flavorful, it's so delicious. It's gonna be probably a lot better than anything that you'll get at a, a restaurant. It's gonna feel like you're walking into a Mexican grandmother's house and, and eating her home cooking. Build the pozole bar, have a great time, and enjoy it with your friends.